Welcome everyone to this exercise session on nuclear medicine imaging. So before we will dive into the first question of the exercises, um, I want to briefly explain you the aim of molecular imaging. So as you can of course guess from the name already, the aim of molecular imaging is to image molecules inside the human body. And how can we do that? So this if you look at that picture here on the top right, our aim is to apply or to inject a molecule of interest. So for example, let's say we're interested in the glucose metabolism. So we'd like to inject glucose into the human body. Then of course, glucose is metabolized. So first of all, it's distributed with the bloodstream, right? To different organs, and then it gets metabolized. And we want to visualize that process. And one way of doing that is to label our molecule of interest. And in nuclear medicine, we use radioactive isotopes that emit gamma radiation to do that. So as an example, I already told you, sometimes we're interested in the metabolism of glucose. Why is that? It's for example, because we know that some tumors have higher glucose metabolism. Or for example, we want to we want to image the glucose metabolism of the brain. So we inject around yeah, between 100 and 300 megabecquerels of radioactive glucose. So if, actually, if you do the math, you can see that those are approximately 10 to the 12 molecules. And if you convert it to mass, you can see that's only roughly a microgram. So the amount that we inject is actually tiny, So which is good because then it also means we have less radioactivity in the body. But that's also important because if you would inject more, so let's say, for example, if you would inject a gram of glucose or several grams, then of course the body would respond to the injection, right? So for glucose, for example, the body would start to produce insulin, which would change the glucose metabolism. So if you want to really image the metabolism in the pure state, it's important that we only inject a tiny amount of our tracer molecule. And that is possible in nuclear medicine thanks to the, the high sensitivity of our imaging devices. And I've shown here on the bottom actually 3D reconstructions, actually 4D reconstructions. So several 3D images at different time points after injection, after we injected radioactive glucose into a patient. So here you can see in the early frame, so this is five until 20 seconds after the injection, you can see the tracer arriving through the arteries. Then of course, uh, the tracer goes to the capillaries and then leaves again through the veins, which you can see in the second and third frame. So this is basically the first pass of the radioactive bolus. And then if you wait much longer, so like 40 minutes or 50 minutes after injection, we can see that the radioactive glucose is actually nicely taken up by the brain. So if you, if I show you those images, uh, usually a darker color means higher image intensity. So that means more tracer concentration at a given location. And the nice thing in nuclear medicine is that the contrast is produced by our radio tracer molecule. And of course, for different applications and in different clinical fields, there are many different uh, molecules of interest that we can use to generate different contrasts. So the biggest field where nuclear medicine imaging is used is by far oncology. So detecting or imaging tumors or metastasis. So I've shown two examples here on the left. So the first scan is done again with radioactive glucose and that's a scan of a patient with malign lymphomas. And you can see all those spots here. Those are malign lymphomas with increased uh, glucose metabolism. What you can also see, of course, is that you have parts of the body that have uh, just a normal physiological higher uh, glucose uptake, for example, the heart. That depends on how, what you do with the patient before the injection. And the brain, of course, has high glucose metabolism. And of course, um, or the radioactive glucose is excreted by the bladder. So we can also see high uptake in the kidney and in the bladder. And then we see a second example here. This is a different tracer. So it's not radioactive glucose, but it's radioactive sodium fluoride. 
And that tracer can be used to visualize the bone metabolism. So that can be useful, for example, if you want to find the bone metastasis. So you can see here also those focal uptake uh, uptakes and those are bone metastasis. So this was two applications for oncology. The second big field where nuclear medicine or molecular imaging is used is neurology. So basically uh, visualizing or imaging the the uh, functionality or the metabolism of the brain. So one example next to the glucose metabolism is shown here in the middle. That's a tracer that can image uh, dopamine receptors in the brain and this is called PE2I. So very cryptic name but it just somehow binds to the dopamine receptors and you can of course see that here in the striatum of the brain uh, we see of course much more uptake as expected. And the third field where uh, molecular imaging is usually applied is cardiology. So that's imaging the heart, right? And again, you can use radioactive glucose to visualize the, for example, viability of the myocardium as shown in those uh, images here. Or you could, for example, also use uh, traces that uh, visualize the perfusion of the heart. So you could image the viability and at the same time the perfusion of the myocardium. So what are advantages of uh, molecular imaging or let's say molecular imaging in nuclear medicine? So as I told you already, um, the contrast is created by a given radio tracer and that means of course since we have many interesting traces or molecules that we want to, uh, to image we can also, or by, by using different molecules, we can actually image a variety of metabolic processes. So it could be, for example, as I said, glucose metabolism, it could be bone metabolism, it can be uh, perfusion, and so on and so on, or neuroreceptor densities in the brain. So that's why it's also called functional or metabolic imaging. And as I told you on the previous slide, it's, it's actually applied in many different clinical fields, so oncology, neurology, cardiology, and uh, even more fields. Second important difference to other imaging uh, modalities is that our main modalities PET and SPECT we will come in the in the one of the next exercises uh, what they actually stand for is that those imaging techniques are quantitative so what does that mean that means that our reconstructed 3D images or 4D images the intensity in every voxel or pixel has actually a physical meaning or has physical units. So usually we really we are able to reconstruct the tracer concentration, for example, in kilobaccarol per milliliter. So that means activity per unit volume. So this is, for example, if you compare it to MR, where the image intensity is, is more complicated, right? So there it's somehow related to relaxation times and proton densities, which is, of course, way more complicated to describe in the end. So in, in PET and SPECT, we can, so the images real, have, have real physical units, so activity concentration, so that it's activity per unit volume. Another example, uh, another advantage is that, uh, as I told you, we already need tiny amounts of traces to inject, so usually in the range of micrograms or if you convert it to activity, so a few hundred uh, megapacarels. Um, this is nice because, of course, we don't want to inject too much dose into the patient. And um, that's also important to respect the tracer principle. So if you if we inject too much of our interesting molecule, of course, we will change the metabolism, which we don't want. So this is different to, for example, if you use contrast agent in MR or CT. So there you really have to inject much more, so uh, half a gram or grams. And if you would do that with many traces, you will change the metabolism, which is usually not what you want. Another advantage is that usually that depends a bit on your tracer, uh, is that the background between your interesting targets, so for example, the tumor and the background tissue can be very high. So if we go back for a second, if you focus here on the left image, I mean, visually you can see this very high contrast between the uh, lymphomas and the background tissues. So it can be, easy to, to detect them. So, but of course that depends a bit on your tracer characteristics. So basically on the affinity of, of your tracer. And last but not least, um, many techniques or many 
traces a very high specificity. So the signal is actually quite clear what you see. But of course, that depends of course on the trace. I already told you in the beginning that to do imaging in nuclear medicine, we use gamma radiation. And we have uh, two types of gamma radiation that we use. So we have isotopes that emit single gamma rays. So the most famous example that is used in nuclear medicine is uh, 99 meter stable technetium. And if we label a molecule with a single gamma emitter, we can use the modality called SPECT to do, to do uh, or to reconstruct uh, the 3D tracer uh, distribution. A uh, second way of doing imaging is called PET, so that's positron emission tomography. So in this modality, we actually use a radioisotope that emits positrons. And of course, if a positron is emitted, it quickly annihilates with an electron and produces two gamma rays, and they are emitted back to back, which makes uh, life a bit easier. And then we can yeah, use that to do also imagery construction. So we use either for imaging, we use either single gamma emitters or positron emitters that in the end also produce uh, gamma rays. As a side note, so this is beyond uh, that course here or beyond the medical imaging course. Um, in nuclear medicine, we also do therapy, so not only imaging. And there we use radioisotopes uh, that emit electrons or alpha emitters.